from a participant's point of view, like I, which maybe I shouldn't say, but every workshop I go to, I try and find a TA who I can be friends with, who will kind of just like sit near me the whole time. <laughs> just like, <laughs> hey. Explain everything the instructor said. Yeah. No, Personal literally. tutor. <laughs> and I mean, honestly, having been in workshops with Jonas and Johnny, now I've said that, they might be able to remember that I kind of recruited one TA to be my like person. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> <laughs> and then they'd start walking away and I'd be like, I've got a question, actually. <laughs> Big thanks to our partners, Linode, Fastly, and LaunchDarkly. We love Linode. They keep it fast and simple. Check them out at linode.com slash changelog. Our bandwidth is provided by Fastly. Learn more at fastly.com. And get your feature flags powered by LaunchDarkly. Get a demo at launchdarkly.com. What's up, Gophers? Our friends over at Gravitational made a big transition at the end of 2020 to rebrand as Teleport and shared a new product announcement to showcase the direction they're taking. Teleport is operating from a vision of being able to run and access software anywhere in a secure and compliant manner, something they call environment-free computing. With Teleport, engineering teams can quickly access any resource anywhere using a unified access plane that consolidates access controls and auditing across all environments, infrastructure, applications, as well as data. Teleport server access lets you SSH securely into Linux servers and smart devices with a complete audit trail. Teleport Kubernetes access lets you access Kubernetes clusters securely with complete visibility to access and behavior. And finally, Teleport application access lets you access web apps running behind NAT and firewalls with security and compliance. Try Teleport today in the cloud, self-hosted, or open source. Head to GoTeleport.com to learn more and get started. Again, GoTeleport.com. Go time. Welcome to Go Time, your source for diverse discussions from around the Go community. We record the show live on YouTube each and every Tuesday at 3 p.m. U.S. Eastern, 7 p.m. UTC. Subscribe at youtube.com slash changelog to be notified when we go live. And don't forget to follow Go Time FM on Twitter and vote on our unpopular opinion polls. This is very important stuff. Okay, let's do this. Here we go. Welcome to our workshop edition of Go Time. I am Angelica Hill. I will be your host today, and we are joined by three wonderful women and the incredible Johnny. First of all, we have Natalie, who wears several hats. Among them, she is a developer advocate, an organizer at GoForCon Europe, and an instructor of various different workshops, including about ML at GoForCon in the US. Uh, and also loves attending workshops and learning. So hello, welcome Natalie, how are you? Hi Angelica, it's uh, great to be here with you as a host. It's always uh, (laughs) great to have British people in this position. Love the accent. Thanks for doing that. Uh, Me and Matt thought we'd just swap out because most people probably won't tell the difference. We'll see. Um, Secondly, we have one of our guests on this show, Jonas, who is an engineering manager at the New York Times. She formerly organized uh, Women Who Go New York City, She's also coordinated and led many workshops over the years, including Intro to Go, Go Modules, and Domain Driven Design. So happy to have you, Jonas. Thanks, Angelica. Can't wait to dive in. Very, very excited. Um, Next up, we have Anna, who's actually currently building a workshop herself from scratch for GoForCon Europe about security in Go. She organizes the Frankfurt chapter of the Go User Group. Uh, And in this role, she coordinates and has led various different workshops over the last few years. So happy to have you, Anna. Very excited to hear more about your workshop. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. And yeah, I'm looking forward. (laughs) And then last, but certainly not least, uh, you may know him as a regular guest on the show. But other than that, he is... Involved in, honestly, every single part of the Go community, it seems. He has been teaching Go workshops for a number of years. He has run the Boston Go user group, the Baltimore Go user group. He's taught at GopherCon many, many years in a row. He's chairing this CFP process for GopherCon as well. And he's just generally an incredibly helpful mentor in the Go community. I myself went to one of his workshops. It was my first Go workshop ever. 
So he is certainly a kind of go-guru in the field. He's also currently doing some of the O'Reilly teaching online. So do check him out. And honestly, any conferences, meetups, Google his name, you'll probably see him at a million and two different meetups. So yeah, very invested in the Go community. So very excited to hear your input here, Johnny. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So we're going to dive right in. And I'd love to hear first, kind of what do you find the most useful about workshops when you're looking to learn or teach as opposed to kind of books, giving talks, presentations? Uh, I might turn over to you, Jonas, first. I think the biggest thing for me with the workshop is really the more hands-on part of it in that you have an instructor or a TA or, or even your fellow learners right there with you as you're learning. So that's the biggest part is it's it's kind of this collaborative learning where you're really getting into it. It's the most unique part. I think you can't really do that in a book. And then Anna, I mean, when you're thinking about kind of going into GoForCon Europe and wanting to maybe distribute your wonderful knowledge of security and Go, why did you think a workshop might be the best way to do that as opposed to maybe doing, doing a talk? Yeah, I think a workshop, as Jonas mentioned, um, gives you more hands-on than just a talk. Like, if I tell you something, you probably say I know it, or uh, good to know, but you don't do it by yourself. You don't experience what it means to do things wrong, or do things correctly, or how easy it is. And I think that's something only a workshop can offer so easily. Um, because even if I do live coding, you won't do anything as a listener there. And then in terms of when you're trying to begin thinking about what content you're going to include in a workshop, when you're thinking, okay, I've got this, I want to distribute my knowledge, I feel like I have enough experience in a certain topic that I feel ready to to kind of teach, where do you start in terms of thinking about, okay, how do I structure this? How much information should I put into my workshop? I might turn over to you, Johnny, for this one, because I think that really is is the the highest roadblock. Certainly, like I have only run maybe like one or two workshops ever, and that was the roadblock for me not doing it more. Is I feel like okay, I, I want to help people learn, I want to distribute knowledge, but where do I even start? Well, the good news is uh, at this point, with sort of the lifespan of the Go community, there's there's a lot of you know, content out there, right? When uh, I started doing these workshops, it was a bit harder. There was a basically a handful of blogs to sort of uh, rely on and a handful of uh, sort of learning material, maybe one or two books uh, that folks kept rec- recommending. So it's gotten a lot easier, right? Um, as folks sort of pick up Go and, and they're sort of uh, documenting their own journey with the learning the, the certain aspects of Go. It's certainly gotten easier to sort of have a baseline, have a starting point for how you put together curriculum or material. But when I did it, it was uh, and it may seem like to to even sort of uh, um, think about putting together a workshop and thinking about putting together a curriculum, it, that tends to be a very intimidating concept, like to wrap your head around. Like the first time you do it, your imposter syndrome just kicked in, kicks in hard, right? You're like, like who am I to to think I can teach other people, right? Like you, you're you're just you're just completely like you know fear and panic, and then somehow you push through it. And if you have a support system and you know, people that encourage you, encourage you to sort of move forward, and you kind of take advantage of that. But the thing for me was that I was on my own sort of journey of learning Go, right? It's not like I was already an expert in Go when I decided to teach my first workshop. Like I was really no better than the the person who spent you know maybe two or three months just you know playing around and go the go playground or something like that. I was no no better, right? I, I knew a little bit more and that's all you really need as a go or really like any language, anything you're trying trying to teach. If you spend just a couple of weeks learning something, you are gonna be that much better than somebody who spent zero weeks learning something, right? Especially if you're targeting like, you know, beginners for for a piece of technology. You are going to know it just a little bit more, just enough to be able to say, hey, you who are just starting out and kind of confused, just like I was a couple of weeks ago, um, let me show you what I've learned, right? So it's gotten easier and it's supposed to get easier um, the more you do it, um, as with all things in life. But it's not, uh, you don't just wake up one day like, you know what, I'm an expert now, now I can teach, right? There's no such threshold. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Like for me, most of the workshops were I found something that I'm curious about, I dive right in. I did like all sorts of things with it. I made way more mistakes than many other people. (laughs) And I just got really familiar with a specific niche. And then I started feeling more comfortable answering questions about this and then kind of putting into words 
the code behind what I built and then explaining the different parts of it. And this is really kind of a good foundation for what a workshop is. And I think the confidence of making all sorts of mistakes and just knowing that at least some of the questions that people will be asking you, you have experienced yourself and you kind of dealt with that while trying to figure out how to go about this is also helpful in feeling somewhat confident in going and saying, yeah, I can teach this. And in terms of actually like practically, like how do you start structuring it? Is it that you kind of, you get Google Doc up, you start writing notes, you get a slide deck up. I'd love to hear maybe for, from Anna. I mean, you're literally doing this right now, putting your talk together. How did you start that? Yeah, I started with the idea. And then I thought like, okay, security and ghost like a lot. Then I collected some ideas and um, Natalie organized also Roberto as a mentor on the idea for me. And um, I had a, I think, roughly 30 minute call with him where we talked about the ideas. And that was actually really great because he was like, yeah, I think this idea is too techy or too deep dive into it. And that's my experience from doing it. And then we discussed about it and came up with kind of, I think, a good idea. So I think that's important that you have a vision in mind, that you know how your path is going. And now I'm in the stage of researching a bit on what's there already. So which resources are there because I can't cover all. So I have to focus on some aspects. Um, currently doing my research on this to write up my slide deck. <laughs> awesome. I mean, I would love to hear, I know you, you you talked about Natalie kind of pairing you up with a mentor. I, maybe we can just take a step back. Natalie, I'd love to hear a little bit more about the great program you've been putting in place uh, for people putting together workshops for GoCon Europe this year. Yeah. So it's always hard to come up with workshops for conferences as a conference organizer, you know, as a person who gives a workshop. And different conferences go about different ways in building their workshop offerings. I would say that most talks go about in the same path, in the sense that there's a call for papers, people submit talks, there's a review committee, you have a rating, and then based on that, you pick and invite speakers. But for workshops, there is such a big variability of how to do this. I see some conferences just send out invites. Other conferences have sort of call for workshops and some have something hybrid in between. This year, I wanted to do something that I have not done so far as an organizer of a conference or as a person who's behind the scenes, not as a person who's giving a workshop. And I asked Johnny and I asked Bill if they would agree to have a mentee who is a developer but have not necessarily taught the workshop just yet and give a workshop together. And it was a pretty open-end request. You can teach an existing workshop, you can build the workshops from scratch, whatever you find right. And Anna and her technical advisor, Roberto and Clapis, thank you very much for doing this. Here's a shout out to you, Roberto. Anna is a PhD researcher in securities. I guess you get the, the support behind the stage and not as a co, uh, not as two people teaching the workshop, but this is a, definitely a new format in, in GoFarCon Europe and it's, uh, it's pretty exciting. Yeah, uh, in about one and a half months, we'll see how the feedback is and I'm sure it's going to be anywhere between this is awesome too, this is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> nice. You mentioned jo Johnny, I mean, you're one of the mentors. What happens if you get paired with someone who, you know, comes to you bluntly with an idea that isn't fully formed, that is kind of hand wavy, isn't feeling like a viable, I guess, workshop? Like, how do you coach them? How do you help them form that idea if they're not coming to the table with all of the materials, all of the ideas that you may have liked? Because I, I mean, one of my thoughts is that my problem would be I'd come with just wanting to teach everything to everyone and just getting overexcited and like, I want to teach everything about Go in an, uh, in an hour. And I can do that for sure. <laughs> but I'm sure like there's the other side of the spectrum where you have people who really want to push themselves. They want to give a workshop. They want to grow. But maybe they are like, oh, 
I only feel comfortable perhaps talking about a small number of concepts. How do you kind of keep them in their comfort level, but also encourage them to, I guess, stretch? Actually, I should take a step back and say thank you to Natalie for sort of um, coming up with this idea. I think it's an excellent way of creating more bandwidth within the community, right, for people who can teach. And, and I don't think it's going to be a surprise if you, you know, go online and start uh, searching around for who teaches go around the community. You're going to see the same set of people coming up over and over and again. Um, but for better, for worse, I might be one of them. <laughs> the thing is, we can't sort of rely on just a handful of people to do all the teaching, right? Um, that's not going to scale. And frankly, we, we need more. Um, we need a diverse representation of teachers. So one of the things, that, you know, and this is the sort of small tangent, and I'll come back to your question. One of the things that has always sort of bothered me, right, as sort of my day job is as an SRE, but, you know, I, I do do professional training on the side. So one of the things that has always bothered me within that training industry, technology training in industry in particular, is that there are so few people who look like me, right? So that bothers me every time I go on Pact or Riley or, or wherever and I see the, the portfolio of, of trainings happening. And it's like there's a maybe one or two, right, out of you know 50, 100 trainers, right, professionals who have been doing this for a while and, and happen to be teaching. There's just one or two faces, right, of people who look like me. So even when I get tired, I'm like, oh, man, should I retire from, from, from training, right? Like, you know, like I've, I've taught, you know, same material over and over again. The part of the joy of teaching the material was because I was learning it at the same time, right? So now I've, I've, could have, I've sort of moved that set of material that I'd like to pursue other things. And then but every time I do that and I go and look at those pages and I'm like, ah, I can't, you know, we need we need more people, right? We need, we need the next generation, right, to, to start coming in. And the best way to do that is to help grow these people, right? They're not gonna just, you know, just op you know, show up one day. Um, we have to take an active role in sort of developing and growing these people. So Natalie, thank you, big shout out to you. I think it's an excellent idea and I really, really hope uh, it succeeds beyond the GoForCon uh, EU conference. Now to answer your question uh, more specifically, when someone comes to you and says, well, I really wanna teach this particular subject, right? And, and, and as you inferred, the idea may, may need a bit more sort of developing, it may need a bit more sort of padding, if you will, sort of adding some, some of the missing pieces, right? The biggest thing you can do as sort of a mentor is to take the idea and sort of a, a develop it, right? Sort of a provide the hands as well. Have you thought about if, if you're sitting down for the first time and doing this, or if maybe if you've been doing this for a little while, how might we make this more interesting for somebody who's not a complete newbie, but you know, wants to, you know, maybe you get them to think about your particular problem in a different way, right? But if you are a complete newbie, how am I sort of approaching this? You know, when I sit down, how am I going to think through this? Because if you, you yourself happen to be a newbie, you're going to have a very different perspective, right? than somebody who's who's on the other side and has been you know maybe playing around with the language for a while right so it's about giving enough context for to that individual to say hey you know what in your workshops very rarely will you have everybody who's at the same exact level i've done this many many times no workshop has you know the same level of, of sort of competence for people coming in for a given piece of technology you might have some people who know a little bit more uh you might have people who know a lot and it just showed up just because it's the that's the only block of time they could carve out to come do some practicing, <laughs> you know, but they already know some of the material. You might have people who are complete newbies, you know, that you tell them, you know, open up your shell. They, they look at you, you know, with a blank stare, what's a shell, things like that. So you, you have to be able to somehow make the material sort of accessible enough, make it interesting enough that if you are a newbie, it's not overwhelming, right? That when you leave that workshop, you're not going to just forget about it because it was, you know, it confirms your suspicion that it was way too complicated and it's not for you, right? You, you want to avoid that. But at the same time, you make it somewhat interesting enough and for somebody who's who's not a complete beginner to still find joy in in the workshop and a lot of times you know you end up sort of um, making these people sort of impromptu tas in your workshops as well right so it's about basically and, and what i usually uh, tell sort of a, a new trainer is to basically say hey have multiple levels to your material for example right so what i really enjoy doing in my material is to basically say you know start out with one idea right and i keep layering on some sophistication to the idea right as we go right so it's the same idea, it's the same thread you're pulling on throughout the entire workshop. And then we just keep adding some complexity to it, right? Um, some necessary complexity to it and in some ways to actually solve those more complex problems, you know, as we go through the workshop. That way, it's the same idea that you're sticking to, you know, you're not sort of, you know, explaining a new domain every time you go do a different exercise, right? But that increase in complexity allows somebody who's brand new to be able to, you know, spend time in the sort of a lower tiers as they sort of wrap their heads around things. And for those who are a bit more experienced, they can go ahead and, and sort of keep climbing the ladder, right, to get to the more complicated and more interesting stuff, right? Providing that context, right, of, hey, basically, hey, hey, there's going to be a lot of different 
folks a lot of different skill sets in your workshops. You got to try to give them a, each of, a, of them a little something, right, is one of the core things that I try to teach. I mean, off the back of that, I'd love to hear from you, Jonas. I know you've taught a lot of different workshops to a lot of different levels from like, as I mentioned, like intro to go, the absolute people are walking into this room, have no idea what go is, all the way up to more intermediate, et cetera. And I'd love to hear how, well, two things. One, how do you think about what to include per level? And secondly, how do you kind of make sure that even though you might say, okay, this is an intermediate or this is a beginner, kind of to what Johnny said, you, you give everyone enough of a challenge, but also not pushing them too far that they then disengage and go, oh no, this is too difficult. Like, <laughs> like I can't do this. It's a good question because it's something always uh, fine tuning. I think, so the first thing I do really think about is my audience. I try to be really mindful. You know, it, it will depend on, am I doing this workshop through a business or through a Golang meetup? You know, you'll have kind of different perspectives coming from that audience. And so usually I might try to then cater what I focus on or what I emphasize based on that audience a little bit. For example, when I do intros that are more focused on people who are learning programming generally, right, I focus maybe less on why you should use Go and Go is so cool. Like I'm more about using Go to help you understand programming. And then I'll kind of note some of the cool things about Go. But I want to like, I want you to understand programming first <laughs> before I convince you that Go is the best language. And, you know, and I also try to really focus on whatever level I want to make sure people are leaving, feeling like they've spent time in that workshop, you know, getting enough hands-on experience that they can then take it forward. So I think kind of to what Johnny was saying, you know, build on with each exercise. You're always going to start a little simple, you know, and even if you have a more advanced, like they'll keep going, but I always want to make sure everything should build and feel cohesive. That's the main thing I find is like, I want everything to kind of connect um, in the exercises. They shouldn't feel just kind of like, here's one exercise and here's a totally unrelated one. Cause I think that helps create the flow for, even if you're at different levels, you kind of see how it all comes together at the end. That's the goal. It should be a nice little package at the end. And then even just, you know, with the various exercises and hands on things, I do try to provide different options to pursue so that you'll emphasize it's a beginner workshop and you're going to get someone there who's like, oh yeah, I've got this Go server running, you know? And so like, I try to provide a mix of, you know, oh, if you finish this quickly, try this just so that also there's different ways people can engage because it's hard to get just one kind of skill or expectation in your group. And then turning to kind of how workshops have changed since we went into this kind of weird remote world. I know we've always had virtual workshops, but I would love to hear from both those who are kind of stepping into it, doing workshops in the more recent times versus like those like, you know, Johnny Jonas, who've been doing them for, you know, many, many years. Have you seen a change in kind of the way that you would approach remote workshops, both in terms of live versus remote, but also like remote workshops in normal times versus remote workshops now when people are staring at their screens like most of the time? Is there an adjustment, kind of an acknowledgement that maybe they need more breaks or or kind of you need to, I guess, ch change it up even more? Maybe, I don't know, Natalie or, or Anna, as you're thinking through your, your workshop, Anna, maybe? That's actually a good one from attendee perspective. I realized uh, that um, workshops can be much better digital if you have hmm. a good speaker, um, yeah. because you can really use the digital material in the sense that you can make stuff interactive and give breaks. But that's really challenging. Having said that, I think that's also one of the biggest challenge. You have to take into account that you that you split up your material and make it interactive because you can't go easily to the people. And you have to clearly know how to interact with them, where to ask. I agree with Anna very much, yeah. Um, my experience as a, a person who gave more in-person workshops and several virtual workshops too, I would say that this, uh, like you need to be more engaging. There is something about the energy in the room, which is not the same when it's virtual and it's very hard to reproduce. So it's a lot more on you as the instructor. It's also a lot more on the attendee in the sense of when you are in the room, when you're in a physical workshop as an attendee, I, as an instructor, can see how many roughly, like, is half the room understanding what I'm doing and half thinking this is too fast or too boring? Is it a different split? Is everybody bored? Is everybody is like, oh my God, how did you reach this point? And so on. When it's virtual and everybody have 
the video off, the camera off, and maybe like two people have a picture, which is static anyway, you have no means of reading the room. So it's on you to ask more questions, to give more pauses. Um, also more breaks in the sense that uh, in a physical workshop, it would always be, let's say, three, four, five hours and maybe one or two breaks in between. And in the virtual workshops, every round hour, you would give 10, 15 minutes because it's impossible otherwise. Uh, that the, Because the, that energy is not there, you have to compensate in this means. And also having a teaching assistant becomes a completely different type of help that you need. Um, in a virtual workshop, or in a physical workshop, it would be you explain something or say, now we exercise this, you leave the thing running on the screen, and then you and the teaching assistant go between the crowd and answer all the different questions. And you have the option to approach each person one by one, look at their screen together and kind of understand what's going on. In a virtual one, uh, you have teaching assistants uh, that people usually for some reason are shy to ask for help. Um, and then there's always the two, three people who are very active and very and understanding and everything and give you a good feedback, but they don't represent the crowd and it's very easy to engage with them and forget that. And then there's other two or three people who are you know, very good in giving feedback that they don't know what you're like, where they, they don't keep up with you, but they also don't represent the crowd, but they can easily take up your resources. And then finding a way to balance all that is another extra work for you as an instructor. And then between all that, also try to um, make sure you meet the time and also keep your cat quiet. This is becoming like a whole <laughs> show. <laughs> Let me tell you, I miss face-to-face -face workshops. I really, really do. Because I can't tell you how many times I will introduce a concept, right? And then know how fast to move on, how slow to sort of, a, a, how to pace myself, how to know when everybody's ready to move on, when nobody's ready to move on. As a teacher, you can look at people's faces, right, in the crowd <laughs> and see who's getting it and who's not, right? Like, like you can get those, those physical cues, nonverbal cues. Oh man, they are gold to a teacher because they help you, right, with pacing. They help you with sort of a knowing that, okay, did this uh, metaphor I just used, did that make sense at all? Or do I need to really you know, uh, stick to uh, something s simpler or whatever, right? So a lot of that, those cues that you just lose those in an online context. And let me tell you, like Natalie's saying, when you do it online and folks a lot of times have their videos off, right? Especially if you have a sort of multi-hour, you know, four, five, six, you know, God forbid an hour, like an eight hour, uh, an eight hour long sort of full day thing you should expect people to sort of tune in and out because, you know, yes, they might be in your class for that amount of time, but life's still going on, right? They're still getting pinged and buzzed and emailed and, you know, maybe there's a boss asking, asking for something and they can't, you know, wait till later or whatever the case may be. Maybe you have children, you know, pulling on your leg or whatever. I mean, things happen, right, in the real world. And as a trainer, you kind of, one, be aware of, of these things and also sort of a uh, change, be willing to sort of change your style a little bit as you go, right? So, you know, again, having more questions, you know, keeping people engaged. I mean, sitting around, sitting on, at your desk for eight hours straight, you know, with some breaks in between, that gets tiring very quickly. Um, so you have to find a way to keep them engaged, whether it's through questions and whether it's actually letting them do some of the work. Like one of the things that really sort of bothers me in terms of training is that if you have somebody sort of talking, you know, at you for eight hours straight, right? Um, you know, minus breaks, whatever it is. I need to be able to actually hear what you're saying, see you show me some examples, and then for me to actually try something, right? Using the knowledge you just gave me, right? Because otherwise, this might as well be a recording, right? That I can play, pause, whatever, whenever I want, right? And do it at my own time, my own pacing, right? And I can find my own exercises if, if there's not going to be any time for exercising, you know, during the workshop. One of the major benefits of actually having a live instructor, right? Be it online or face to face, one of the key advantages is that you can ask them questions in real time when you don't understand something, right? So if it's, if it's a video, you can pause it and then you have to go on and, uh, on your own and, and you know your specifics might, might take you a long time to find answers for your specifics. But in a live training, you know you get to ask your specific question and then the instructor then tells you, well, maybe you're being too specific. You know, think about it this way instead. Or yes, there's an answer to your specific, you know, problem, right? So these things, you should take advantage of those things if you happen to be a student. But yeah, to, to bring it back around, the whole uh, pandemic thing, I can't wait for that to be over, man. <laughs> I need to get back into the classroom, looking at people in the, in the face, you know, until I can, so I can actually get and enjoy this again.
This episode is brought to you by Sourcegraph. Sourcegraph is universal code search to let you move fast, even in big code bases. Here's CTO and co-founder Byung Lu explaining how Sourcegraph helps you to get into that ideal state of flow in coding. The ideal state of software development is really being in that state of flow. It's that state where all the relevant context and information that you need to build whatever feature or bug that you're focused on uh, building or fixing at the moment, that's all readily available. Now the question is, how do you get into that state where you know you don't know anything about the code necessarily that you're going to modify? That's where Sourcegraph comes in. And so what you do with Sourcegraph is you you jump into Sourcegraph. It provides a single uh, portal into that universe of code. You search for the string literal, the pattern, whatever it is you're looking for. You dive right into the, the specific part of code that you want to understand. And then you have all these code navigation capabilities, jump to definition, find references that work across repository boundaries that work without having to clone the code to your local machine and set up and mess around with editor config and, and all that. Everything is just designed to be seamless and to aid in that task of you know code spelunking or, or source diving. And once you've acquired that understanding, then you can hop back in your editor, dive right back into that flow state of, hey, all the information I need is readily accessible. Let me just focus on writing the code that implements the feature or fixes the bug that I'm working on. All right, learn more at sourcegraph.com and also check out their bi-monthly virtual series called DevTool Time, covering all things DevTools at sourcegraph.com slash DevTool Time. Aside from kind of needing to juggle a million and two things, as Natalie said, I'd love to hear whether those of you who have done kind of workshops pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, now fully remote, when you're planning out your workshop, is there a kind of thought put into a so putting in like social aspects to it? I do do a, maybe if it's a smaller workshop, an icebreaker at the beginning. Hey, everyone introduce themselves. Because certainly as someone who loved going to workshops in person. One of the core benefits was I just met so many awesome, amazing people that I could form connections with, learn from through, you know, after the workshop, just honestly, just make friends. And I'm interested in that, if that's a consideration when you're planning out a remote workshop is, is that important? Do you feel like you can't really do that in, in a remote setting? Or if you can, how do you do that? I mean, if I was planning a workshop, I would just probably get everyone chatting the whole time and not end up getting to the material. So, <laughs> I don't know, but Jonas, is there something you might you put thought into? Yeah, you know, and I'm trying to think back on some remote things. I mean, certainly leveraging like the breakout functionalities in mm -hmm. these tools is a nice tool. Honestly, it's, it's kind of maybe one of the benefits of having remote is you can use those. And I, I found sometimes too, if you have like a cohesive breakout group that you're with throughout the whole training. So you're kind of going back and checking in with the same people mm -hmm. that can be kind of nice and trying to keep up where I've set up like a Slack channel too. So that we're one, I think a bit to Johnny's point is like, you can share updates and the resources as you go. So if people are jumping in and out, they can kind of catch up, but then also it's a space where everyone can just be to chat after or catch up or connect through that means as well. So I guess just trying to use all the different tools available in some ways, I just try to think of like, what's every technical <laughs> option I can leverage and let's throw it out there and then see what sticks. <laughs> I think you can also use like nice icebreakers in the beginning. I have seen that also already was like putting a needle from where you are, like there was a map and a tool and you should simply draw a circle or something and put your name next to it or something like this. That's something funny or uh, like simple questions you have like, who is a cat lover? Yes, no, or something such that you have like a state, you have something to love and you break the ice a bit. I think that's also something you can do digital as well as remote, uh, not remote analog um, in person. And I think that's valuable. Having said that, it also depends highly on the attendees. At once lecture and I tried things and I, I struggled so much because I found it much more dis difficult to make stuff interactive digital than doing it in person. So I felt like, yeah, what should I throw all at you? <laughs> I want to have some interaction. That's also something which is really cool, but as mentioned before, People have to, to engage with it. 
And I think it's much easier to be someone anonymous, digital now, especially as a lot of people turn their cameras off, which I think is not the coolest thing to do, especially in a workshop like this. Uh -huh. Because in person you would also see each other and a face tells so much which you can't get only by by seeing and if I don't have the camera on I could also look at a recording or something like this if I don't engage. So what's the benefit of attending a live workshop then? Um, but that's only my opinion. <laughs> no, for sure. I would love to hear how do you keep your, I mean, it kind of goes to two parts. From the veterans who have done a lot of workshops, how do you keep your material like fresh and fun and engaging? And for those who are kind of are more new to the space, how do you think about keeping them entertained? I mean, is it like trying to do call outs? Is it telling jokes? Is it having interesting analogies? I've done a few workshops where I've tried to crack a joke or do like a clever analogy and it's fallen so flat. <laughs> Everyone's faces, virtual faces were blank, just like, and I don't know whether they just couldn't understand what I was saying or I just, it was a really bad analogy. They were laughing on the inside. <laughs> <laughs> I know, Johnny, you use a lot of analogies. Is there a time that it fell flat? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's one of those things where over time you sort of find out what works and what works for you, right? So I've tried, you know, picking up, you know, random, you know, jokes here and there, but because they didn't come from my life, right? They didn't come from my my experiences, you know, when I'd tell them, uh, even though I'd find them amusing, people, you know, because the delivery ended up somehow uh, the authentic authenticity of it, you know, because it wasn't my story, you know, that I was telling, it was missed. And yeah. I learned very quickly, people can always tell when you're being authentic, right? At least they can tell when you're being fake and not completely honest, right? These things, like you learn them the hard way and you sort of, you know, for the next one, you, you, you try to do better, right? It, one of the sort of uh, the things that I really had to stop doing in my teaching career, if you will, is to basically beat myself up um, for you know, the last training, right? I'm like, oh, I didn't get to teach that thing or oh, I, I hated the way I explained this particular thing. Like everything else, you get better with it over time, right? Like I love analogies. Uh, especially like cooking analogies, you know, like I, I used to use that, you know, how programming is like, you know, cooking and you have recipes and, you know, you, you can call methods and pass in recipe, you know, um, uh, ingredients to, you know, bake a cake, whatever. Like I use these things because during that time, right, I was learning how to cook. So I found a way to sort of incorporate my real life experience into what I was teaching. Right. So those deliveries was authentic and People laugh, they could relate, right? So these things, like you have to somehow tie real things that happen to you, right, to your material in some way, to liven it up, to bring it, bring it alive. And you may not realize like how much of an impact that has, right? Trying to tell somebody else's story, you know, tell somebody else's joke is it, a lot of times it's going to fall flat, right? So it, you got you to own it. You got to own your, 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 your stuff, own you really. <laughs> like you, a lot of it is you're giving so much of yourself as a teacher. Oh, the other thing, and I hope we get to this, like, Teaching other people, like especially if you are uh, somewhat of an introvert and you may, you may not be able to tell, but I, I really love being by myself, right? Like right now I'm, I'm being all open and, and you know, chatting and, and, you know, like it's very easy sort of the, to think that, you know, folks need to be like an extrovert to, to be able to put yourself out there um, to teach and to, you know, even to talk at conferences or at meetups, whatever it is. Like people it can be very, very hard to sort of step out of yourself to do that because of that fear, right? You always fear that, oh man, I'm going to stand in front of all these people, right? It's like, again, like it's, it's very hard to do that, but you don't have to be an extrovert to be a teacher, right? That's something that, again, you can train yourself out of. But again, anyways, I, I'm starting to ramble now. So <laughs> so let's move on. No, for sure. I'd love to hear, Natalie, when you're thinking about how to kind of keep your participants engaged, are you cracking jokes? Are you whipping out the analogies? How do you keep your participants engaged and excited? My ultimate um, tool when, when all else fails, I say, please ask me a question so I can move on. <laughs> okay. And then somebody feels brave enough to ask something. And then uh, finally the secret comes out that, oh, I also didn't understand. Oh, I also didn't understand. And I also didn't understand. Mm -hmm. So this is a, always like a good question to keep uh, in the toolkit, but probably also good not to use it too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I try to ask people to keep the cameras on as much possible to and also ask people to keep the videos, uh, to, to keep the audio on. And I encourage people not to just type their question, but also to unmute themselves and to ask them. 
if I have a teaching assistant, I would also uh, say, uh, so if you would like, I can read your question or the teaching assistant can read your question, but maybe the person who posted this question, you would like to unmute yourself and then kind of develop a bit of a conversation. And I think there is, it's hard to reproduce this um, peer pressure that is there, that is present in a uh, in-person workshop, right? In an in-person workshop, if I tell a joke, somebody laughs because they're polite and then everybody else laughs because, well, people are laughing. But when everybody's silent, then it's like I told a joke and maybe one person laughed. Nobody gives you this feedback and this acknowledgement. Also reminding yourself that, well, at least statistically, at least one person laughed. So that joke was okay. Uh, this is kind of a few things from the toolkit. <laughs> I'm kind of touching on that. I'd love to, because we haven't chat about it yet the value of TAs and the fact that like how you can use your TAs to really add to that workshop experience for their participants Johnny or really anyone wants to jump in on how you think about TAs I can jump in and I, and I really want to hear some other perspectives as well the reason why I want to jump in is because I think or at least I'm hoping in my head that all of you will have had the same experience I was a TA before I was a teacher because I was too afraid to actually be the one doing the teaching. So, you know, I found at the time I was, I was in Boston and we had lots of uh, Rails bridge uh, workshops going on. And uh, I was doing a ton of Ruby and Rails at the time. And and I was like, okay, like, I know I don't know enough or, uh, well, I knew about the technology, but I didn't know about teaching. The two are very, very different things, right? Just because you know a technical subject doesn't mean you can teach it. Those are very different skill sets, right? So I was, you know, self-aware enough to realize, okay, I'm not in a place where I can actually do the delivery of the, the material. Uh, there are other others who can do that job way better than I can, but I can help in other ways. I can be in the room, help somebody, you know, uh, figure it out while hopefully not touching their keyboards. That's a side note. T TAs don't touch other people's keyboards. It's it's that's even more so now, you know, pandemic times, you know, after we're done with this. But you know, even before then, you didn't touch people's keyboards for a different reason, right? You know, because if you take that power from them, they're not gonna learn as much, right? So don't touch people's keyboards. Um anyways, <laughs> I was this, you know, this guy as a TA, I was like, okay, that that's that's the way for me to sort of immerse myself, expose myself, right? And, and really like when you're that up close and personal with somebody who's learning something for the first time, you get to see their struggles. You get to see how they struggle, right? And then now when it's your turn to teach, because you've been a TA, you know, half a dozen times, you know exactly where the common pain points are. You know exactly where they get stuck. You know exactly, you know, when, when somebody up there, at, you know, at, at the lectern says something um, that they think makes sense to them, right? Because maybe, you know, they're, they're a little bit more advanced. So, you know, they mention a word and they think everybody knows what that word is, right? You know, I've had students like turn around, look at me and says, what did he just say? <laughs> you know, so now, you know, now we sit down and I start sort of decomposing what that means, sort of, you know, unpacking, right, all that prerequisite knowledge that you know, who, whoever's up there, you know, teaching the, the subject didn't realize it that needed to convey, right? So now I'm sitting out as a TA sort of uh, explaining some of these things, right? So that experience, right, there was invaluable in helping me understand what it is like to actually be, you know, a good sort of a conveyor of information. Yeah. And I'll just add to that point, like your TAs, they're your eyes and ears. Like they're so helpful as an instructor. You have so much, I mean, it's stressful. You're trying to balance like your slides and your talking and your exercises and your TAs are really going to help you get that real read on the room. Like you're trying to read the room, but the TAs are like right there and they're letting you know kind of where are people getting stuck? Slow down. Like, you know, and they can help be, be a bit of an advocate too for that and give you that check. So they're a huge resource. And I think especially, you know, if maybe you're newer, or you're nervous about doing it, like get TAs and, and get that help because they're just going to make everything a little less stressful when you're trying to teach. <laughs> and they're good sources of feedback. I always try to get feedback from TAs at the end as well. You know, they can usually give you some good insight. And I always encourage them to kind of jump in as needed too. If they they might notice that I'm saying something that no one is getting <laughs> and, and maybe I don't notice it. So I encourage them, like, please step up and add more illustrations or something if I'm failing. And, and I think two points before, I've definitely adopted things from TAs, right? Who I've been like, oh, they explained that so well. I'm going to use that moving forward. So it's an invaluable resource for, you know, someone who's leading a workshop. So as a person who's not native in English, as you might have noticed by my accent, <laughs> A teaching assistant is a term that I first learned in university, and this was somebody who was kind of giving um, classes about whatever the professor was teaching. So the teaching assistant was teaching kind of the 
hands-on or the even kind of workshop equivalent to what the professor was theoretically teaching. But then when I started teaching workshops, I learned that teaching assistant in this context means something pretty different. And this is somebody who has some technical knowledge, like my docker will not run. I don't know what this error means, but it's not necessarily who somebody is as experienced as you are in the content is not necessarily somebody who's able to answer questions, uh, all of them, like maybe some yes, but many times it would be a person who has more housekeeping duties, let's say, than I, in the beginning, expected from a teaching assistant to have. And so in the sense of this is a person who would tell you, hey, this is time to pause. Many people are asking you questions. You are on mute <laughs> to this level also. And just worth pointing out, I guess, that teaching assistant is such a context-rich word for me, at least, and definitely valuable because we talked about this, but reading the room when you're in virtual versus in person is very different and you definitely need a second pair of virtual eyes on your virtual crowd. And that's like an extra duty for the teaching assistant, uh, which is also different for a teaching assistant from in person versus to a virtual workshop. So is there a perfect equation of teaching assistant to participant? Because personally, as an attendee, I would love my own one-on-one TA. (laughs) But I wonder if too many TAs is too many cooks in the kitchen, as it were. You're asking what what would be an ideal ratio? Yeah. What is an ideal ratio? Is, Is there ever like too many TAs? Or is there ever like... If you have, say, a workshop of 20 people, like with one TA, that's not enough. I'm just interested just because from a participant's point of view, like I, which maybe I shouldn't say, but every workshop I go to, I try and find a TA who I can be friends with, who will kind of just like sit near me the whole time. (laughs) Just like, hey. (laughs) Explain everything the instructor said. (laughs) And I mean, honestly, having been in workshops with Jonas and Johnny, now I've said that they might be able to remember that I kind of recruited one TA to be my like person. (laughs) I remember. (laughs) (laughs) And then they'd start walking away and I'd be like, I've got a question actually. (laughs) I'll just pull up a chair. Sit right there. You're not going anywhere. To your question, I've found that the closer the material is to the beginner level, especially how you market the training or the workshop, whatever it is. If you're attracting sort of beginners, you're going to need more TAs, right? So I, for those workshops, I try, to, I try to have a two to one ratio, you know, two students per TA. And it makes it fun when you have like a 40 student workshop. And now you have a lot of people just who mostly seemingly just standing around, just going from table to table, but, but usually ends up working out quite well. Now, if the material is on a more advanced side of the equation, then the fewer TAs, because your TAs are no longer helping with some of the computing basics. Like example, I gave earlier, like you know, somebody not knowing what, what the terminal is, right? You know, they're no longer sort of having to teach some of these things on the way to actually get into the point where they actually can execute on the material, the exercise, right? So these people are self-sufficient. I and mean, when they, when, they, when the, the material is advanced and the people you are attracting in that workshop are more advanced, they don't need that kind of hand-holding, right? So you can get away with having basically, you know, um, five, six, seven, you know, students per TA, right? It depends on really, you know, who you're targeting with your material. I have to say I had um, a way worse ratio. <laughs> um most of the workshops that I've done had a few tens of attendees and I had one at most two uh, TAs. And I remember one workshop that I gave that was particularly bad. It was a beginner's workshop and I had no teaching assistants. It was in a university building and I was standing in like a huge room where you see probably the teach calculus or something there. There's like hundreds of seats and I was also with a few tens of students teaching basics of elastic search or something not go related. And that was particularly not successful. And so definitely I agree, Johnny, with what you say, that the more beginner the crowd is, the more you need like a a ratio that is closer to (laughs) one-on-one. And then I'd love to hear a little bit about kind of from your experiences, what makes a good TA? They feel comfortable interrupting you. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, and I think Johnny touched on this a bit, but I think that someone that just recognizes they're there to kind of guide someone not to solve the problems for them right like you're almost more of a a rubber duck right like you're really just trying to help them understand you never want to just kind of come in and fix it for them so understanding that your role is more to kind of help them guide them along that's kind of the main thing and just empathy and kind of understanding that don't make any assumptions of where the person's coming from or where, where they might be caught just try to be really 
open to where they're struggling and, and just like try to understand where they're getting stuck and help them and don't kind of like just be like, oh, this, you know, oh, we'll jump through this. It's easy or, you know, like avoid that kind of stuff. Just really be open and, and take them step by step. What I'll add to that is I think you touched on it, Jonas. You kind of have to realize that it's not about you. People are there to learn. I have vivid recollections of workshops I've, I've taught that are basically targeted at uh, sort of underrepresented um, folks um, in tech. And the I have vivid recollections of folks sitting there struggling, right? A lot of them to cover some of the basics. Right? So the thing is, here I was showing up to teach, you know, um, go and, you know, I've prepared my material. You know, I'm feeling myself. I'm like, oh, this is good. This is good stuff, right? This is going to be a, a great workshop. There's going to be so much information being relayed. And by the end of it, they're, they're going to walk out of there, you know, being uh, go newbies and sort of uh, ready to start internships and careers and everything. And I was like, my aspirations were so high for the, the results of the workshop that it became about me, all right, and not about the people doing the learning, right? Um, truth be told, I didn't get, you know, like halfway through the work to the content because, I didn't realize that my target audience, right, they, they had so much sort of learning to do to even get to the point where the stuff I was talking about had made, made sense, right? Same thing for my TAs. You know, we huddle up afterwards and they'd tell me, oh, man, like a lot of these folks are struggling with sort of basics of computing, right? They have a laptop, whatever it is, and they bring it in and you tell them to go to the command line or you tell them to install a program or to run a program, whatever it is. And they're kind of like, well, where is the icon on the desktop? Right. Like I, don't, I need to double click that thing and, and launch it, whatever. Again, that's part of the, you know, how you market your training, how do you attract your target audience and a lot of that. But if you are targeting beginners, right, uh, especially if you're targeting folks who are not who are really underrepresented in tech, you should expect right to have an uneven sort of a distribution of some of that basic knowledge right that you might expect with with uh, folks that are sort of um, um, represented or overrepresented in tech, depending on how you want to look at it. Right. So it's not about you the the teacher or the trainer it's about the people you are going to teach and and sometimes you have to adjust on the fly right which i've had to do many many times realizing that okay once once you get into a workshop and you realize okay this is how fast uh, i can go sometimes you can't go fast at all sometimes you have to realize okay i i accept that i'm not going to get through half of this material now once you accept that now slow the f down <laughs> <laughs> and then make sure that you're actually, you know, uh, uh, making sure that when people walk out of there, they have enough baseline knowledge, right? And enough zeal for continuing to learn on their own, right? Which is the key thing that I really, really, that's, that's my bar for, for a successful workshop. When you leave that workshop, are you going to get in touch with me afterwards and says, hey, so I'm continuing to, to do some of the exercises and I'm stuck here, Right. When that happens, I am overjoyed because that means that I did the job that I was supposed to do, which was as a teacher, I'm supposed to inspire you to keep learning. I'm supposed to make the material that seemed before you walked into the workshop seem so complex and so over what your capabilities, your abilities to actually learn and be able to you know, like do right that fear that you had. I want you to walk out of that room no longer having that fear, knowing that there's a challenge there, but that you can do it right and you can do it on your own. And that you have people to help you, right? You can you can get in touch with me to, to help you if you need it. But you you can walk out of there having lost that fear and having gained zeal for learning the material, right? That's my job as a teacher when I when I teach, right? To remove that fear. Again, it's not about the teacher. It's not about the TA. We had to take a back seat in, in order to actually serve our students. Linode is simple, affordable, and accessible cloud computing the developers trust. Linode is our cloud of choice. We trust them, and we think you should build anything you're working on, a fun side project, or that next big infra move at work with Linode. The best part, you can get started on Linode with $100 in free credit. Get all the details at linode.com slash changelog or text changelog to 474747 and get instant access to that $100 in free credit. Again, linode.com slash changelog. that line it's all about your your attendees i would love to hear 
how you think about like almost like attendee management. Like if you have a group who aren't speaking up or there's a few people who, you know, haven't, you're not seeing them engage, how do you kind of help them feel comfortable, encourage them to participate? And on the flip side, if you have someone, and I'm, if I'm honest, if I think back to myself in workshops in the early days, I think I was this person. If you have one person who's taking up a lot of space and is asking like a million and two questions and unbeknownst to them, maybe taking time away from others, how do you maybe help them give others space? Uh, maybe, I don't know, Anna, when you're either from like when you've been lecturing, when you're thinking about your workshop, how are you thinking about almost like people management and trying to make sure everyone feels included, everyone feels like they've had a little bit at least of like one-on-one attention, I guess? It's actually a very good question and a challenging one. I try to engage people. So if you engage them, you get directly feedback from them and know how it's going. If I see that someone is asking questions over and over, I had that once in a local meetup or workshop, small one. I said to the one person, there are other questions, try to Google it, search it, I give them a hint, and then I moved on to the next person to equally spread um, my end. I actually had one TA there, time, because if we were like 10 or 15 people, it's not possible that two people concentrate only on one person all the time Um, and saying that friendly I think that's okay being aware of that no for sure and I agree it's very challenging 100% I don't know whether Natalie or Johnny or Jonas you have any tips because it's certainly very difficult (laughs) yeah I mean I think if it is the case for someone speaking up a lot, you know, yeah, I'll often use the like, hey, you know what, I feel like you have a ton of questions. Why don't we chat a bit later? I want to make sure everyone else has time, you know, or, you know, kind of get that, like, try to note that, like, yes, I want to help you, but we got to help everyone. And and that usually works pretty well. And and I think for the quieter folks, I'll just, uh, I'll note again that TAs are great for that, too. Sometimes if I see someone that looks quiet, you know, I might just sit, ask a TA, like, hey, why don't just check in with them a bit? They might be shy. They may not want to talk up, but, like, just check in on them. So TAs help with that a lot, too. No, for sure. Awesome. So I'm going to ask one last question until we move into what can arguably be my favorite part, which is unpopular opinions. <laughs> um, but the last thing is just for people looking for workshops, what are some tips for looking for workshops that are going to be beneficial? Is it that you should look for the leveling? You should look for who's kind of going to be leading it and look at that background. How do you identify good workshops as someone looking to learn? Of course, take the instructor with the most Twitter followers. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. I would probably evaluate that a workshop feels pretty good if it has a clear explanation of what is your expected knowledge kind of is this from complete beginners should you have some knowledge so this will help me understand that this is a little bit leveling and or kind of like being on the same page of what will be the level of it because what is intermediate for you is not intermediate for me but if you say i need to be somebody who developed at least one web app and deployed it once i will understand a little bit better what does it mean and also something like here's the list of the either topics we will cover or maybe this is all the what you can expect that we will have accomplished then i feel that this is a workshop that is framed enough and i know what am i stepping into I guess just also be mindful of your learning style and, and kind of what's effective for you and, and how they're catering it and if it's going to work for you. Be realistic about what kind of things work for you and don't. So I definitely feel like, especially in a virtual world, I've, I've tried different things and I realized like, oh, this is horrible. I can't pay attention. I need to recognize that this is not a good format for me. You want to get the most out of it. So kind of recognize what sort of things help you really learn versus not. This is a hard one. Anna, you, were you about to jump in? Yeah. <laughs> please, please do. <laughs> um, I wanted to add to Jonas' um, answer that I think it's, it's important that you be aware of what works for you and that you also leverage people you know. But like Natalie asked, forget information about what's working and one other thing. I realized for myself is also looking a bit more into your timetable if you have the time to attend this workshop. Because for me, being like for several hours in some workshop now in the virtual setting is much more exhausting 
than it was before. So if I know I have a week full of meetings, I found even the coolest workshop or get together more exhausting than before. And then it's like, do I learn a lot afterwards? So that's something very specific to this remote setting. But I think it's also important that you're aware of this. Awesome. Well, we have come to what is arguably my favorite part, which is where we hear your unpopular opinion. It can be about anything. It does not have to be technology related, go related. It can be about genuinely anything. I actually think you should probably leave. So I'm going to turn over to our lovely guest, Anna, first. <laughs> what is your unpopular opinion? <laughs> Recently, I realized that this awesome compile time of Go eliminates my too deep press when compiling it because it's too fast. When doing my markdown, I have like, it compiles and I know I can take too deep press before looking at the screen, seeing the errors or seeing that it succeed and be happy. And for the Go program, that doesn't work because I get the results directly. <laughs> so it's a bit too fast, which is great. <laughs> so that's your unpopular opinion. Go is too fast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Become fast. Oh my God, I love that. Okay. And then our lovely other guest, Jonas, what is your unpopular opinion? This is one that I feel like I've noticed more since being remote, but I really generally don't like Slack threads, except for maybe a few exceptions. And I think based on how everyone uses Slack, I'm in the minority, but I get lost. I have a hard time finding things <laughs> and it's like, it's just too much. And there are now threads in DMs and that's absurd. I'm sorry. That just doesn't need to be a thing. <laughs> don't like it. <laughs> I have to say, this is, a, at least for me, this is an unpopular. I love this. It keeps everything organized. It's so nice. I, yeah, I, I, I could not enjoy this more. <laughs> me too. See? All right. Yeah, clearly I'm the minority here. You're the winner. This uh, is a... <laughs> yeah. I mean, is there a way to find like a middle ground where like if a thread gets to like 15, then you have to change it to some other forum? I mean, I've been trying to implement that where like if a thread gets over a certain number, but then we have to jump in a Google Hangout. But not everyone's decided that they want to do that because arguably people don't really want to be in Google Hangouts. And I am, they, they're more adverse to the Google Hangout than this massive thread I found. <laughs> people are actually shutting on Slack already about that. Really? <laughs> Everyone's going to put things in threads. <laughs> <laughs> like, I like this option to, to send the messages from the thread also to the <laughs> overall chat and sometimes it's used and that's that's starting to be confusing <laughs> multi-threading no, I'm terrible if, if I come to a thread that's like longer than I care to read I'll often be like hey guys really sorry can someone give me the TLDR <laughs> <laughs> so that I don't have to read this massive thread <laughs> <laughs> I think that's definitely up for debate. I'd be interested to see who, who finds that unpopular. <laughs> and then Natalie, do you have an unpopular opinion for us? Mine is also about a very useful tool in the tech sphere, Twitter. Okay. <laughs> I think we should stop following people and adopt uh, lists instead. So I saw this as a recommendation of uh, Cindy, uh, aka Copy Construct, who I think is a great really great person about everything infrastructure related. And Cindy said that she stopped following everybody. I think she has something like zero people she's following and she just organized that into lists. And not only it does not show you ads, which is nice, or promoted tweets, but it also you get to build kind of your um, feeds to whatever content you want to see now. And I slowly started implementing this as well. And I'm step by step unfollowing people and putting them into more categories if only a few people do this if i unfollow everybody in this chat it will be a little bit rude 
as if I don't care about you and I don't like you, but it's actually not true. I am, I am consuming your content only when I want something related to what you tweet about. And if we're all going to do this, then it's not going to be about polite or not, or who has more or less followers, or I don't follow you and you don't follow me or something in the Twitter manners, in the Twitter sphere manners. Uh, but it will be just organized for everybody. <laughs> Nice. Because yeah, my social capital is and my self worth is directly correlated to how many Twitter followers I have. Because <laughs> I know our unpopular opinion. <laughs> <laughs> that isn't actually true. <laughs> that is not actually true. <laughs> Honestly, I feel like we are over time, but I like if Johnny, if you have a very succinct, pointed, unpopular opinion, I'm ready for it. I do. And maybe you'll like it. Okay. I think every programmer should at some point try management for a short stint. Try going into management, you know, even this for just six months to a year. And you can go back to being an individual contributor if you want, but you should at least try it once. That's going to change your perspective on a lot of things. So, yeah, yeah managers are not the enemy. Plus 100. <laughs> and product managers are your best friend. <laughs> <laughs> Side note. <laughs> <laughs> well thank you so so much everyone this was truly a delightful conversation i'm really sad that we didn't have more time i think we should have talked for hours on end on this topic um but thank you so much please check out anna's workshop coming up you can check it out go for con europe i'm sure it's gonna be brilliant and obviously all of the lovely speakers will be on go for slack so ping them with many 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 questions and hopefully you'll attend their workshops Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Go Time. If you enjoy the show, please do share it with a friend. Personal recommendations are the number one way people find new podcasts they love. And of course, subscribe if you haven't yet. We're on Spotify. We're on Apple Podcasts. We're pretty much everywhere. You can also check out the back catalog of awesome episodes at gotime.fm. There you'll find our recommended episodes plus listener favorites. And you can even request your own guest or topic. Go Time is produced by Jared Santo with music by Breakmaster Cylinder. Thanks again to our awesome sponsors, Fastly, LaunchDarkly, and of course, Linode. Next up on Go Time, John and Chris welcome a couple of special guests to dive deep into event-driven systems. Stay tuned for that one. It'll be coming at you next week.